Hi guys, and thank you for joining us again. Week three uh, of a hundred years of the return of the Israelites from their Babylonian exile back to Jerusalem and back to Israel. Now tonight we've, we're we going to be looking at the book of Ezra, just very practically um, undoing it, packaging it in a way that I hope uh, will help you understand it better and study it better. We spent the last two weeks doing an overview. I hope that was good for you. Uh, I hope that you have read uh, the book of Ezra and possibly Haggai, Zechariah to prepare you for tonight. And I hope that you have your notebooks and your Bibles with you in whatever format because you're going to take notes tonight and we're going to have a good time. And at the end of tonight, you are going to love the book of Ezra. So Ezra covers about a hundred years of history from uh, 539 BC to about 440 BC, it will take a year or two. And it's, it's very clearly a book of two parts. The first six chapters uh, deal with the first return. And the sec the, from chapter 7 to chapter 10, the, second, the last four chapters deal with the second return. The first return happens under Zerubbabel. And the second return from chapter 7 uh, uh, deals with Ezra returning. And you will remember that from the previous two weeks. So what I'm going to do this evening is just go through chapter by chapter or put chapters together as the topics uh, come up. And so the first two chapters deal with the return uh, of Zerubbabel. And if you, as you read those chapters, you'll see it's, it's, it's a sad, happy picture. If you, it, it talks about the, the, the guys getting together and returning, and there are only 50,000 people that come back when you think of how many millions of people there had been when Israel was at its, at its peak, when it was at its zenith. And then it talks about them coming back with their, their, their possessions and some of the temple furniture, and uh, it gives the lists of how many camels and donkeys and, and uh, camels, donkeys, mules, whatever it is. They didn't even come back with any cows or sheep. Can you believe that? They, they just, they just. In fact, it says they had horses, seven hundred and thirty-six horses, two hundred and forty-five mules, four hundred and thirty-five camels, and six thousand seven hundred and twenty donkeys. Now, when you picture this motley crew, fifty thousand people with their, with their animals, no cows, no sheep, um, and and you and you remember that the theme of this book is is in my mind restoration gives me a lot of hope. And what it tells me is that when, when you and I choose to walk God's way, when, we've, when things have got really messy and we choose to, to go with God, we choose to surrender, to submit, to follow Him, God doesn't need a whole lot to work with in order to restore our lives. If you see this, this picture of, of the restoration work of God beginning in a broken nation, they don't have very much to offer him. And that's the beauty of the restoration of God. A broken and contrite heart, he will not refuse. So the first two chapters deal with uh, the, the gathering and the return. Chapter 3, remember they're now in Israel, and they begin the building process. They, they start rebuilding the temple. And uh, just read chapter 3, verse 8. It says, in the second month of the second year, after their arrival, which puts it at about 537, um, Zerubbabel, I won't go through all his names, uh, they returned, they appointed Levites 20 years old and older to supervise the building of the house of the Lord. So they get back and their first priority, and this is important to understand because so often we, we get our first priority uh, right you know, there's, there's enthusiasm, there's momentum, and, and everybody's going home. And they, 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 they get straight into rebuilding the temple. But it's, it's keeping the first priority in first place that is the challenge. So it's, it's easy to have the right priority first place in the beginning. As, as time moves on, it's, it's harder and harder to keep that thing in priority. And so, but chapter 3 begins with the rebuilding of the temple. They lay the foundation and they have their first service. It's a bit like what we have at World's View where we're just busy trying to get the slab ready for our building. Chapter 4 is a profound chapter. 
It's a chapter that deals with opposition. Now, uh, as you read that chapter, if you try and follow it carefully, it's, if you read it uh, without... How can I put this? If you read it uh, and you're about to fall asleep, it will all make sense. If you read chapter 4 and you, and you really try and study it, it actually doesn't make sense. Uh, how can that be? Because it's covering two time periods in the same chapter. And the only way you can figure that out and, and grasp that is by following the kings. Because it's dealing with opposition uh, to the building of the temple, which was under Zerubbabel, and the, and the kings were Darius, Cambyses, and Cyrus. And then it's also dealing with the opposition uh, that took place to the rebuilding of the wall, which happened under the, the Persian king Artaxerxes. And that's, you say, it wasn't important to know kings and dates because it helps you understand the context. And so chapter 4 deals with opposition in all the phases of the return. It deals with the opposition to Zerubbabel in the rebuilding of the temple. It deals with opposition to Ezra and it deals with opposition uh, that took place when Nehemiah was rebuilding the walls. So the whole of Ezra is a chronological book. It, it happens uh, you know, in, sequence, in time sequence, except for chapter 4. Chapter 4 kind of uh, covers opposition throughout that whole hundred years. And, and it's important to know that because otherwise you get a bit confused when you read that chapter. The important thing to understand with this opposition is that some opposition came from without in the form of people and, and communities and, and groups and, and, and groups lobbying against them. It, it, there was this overt opposition to the rebuilding. But if you read the prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, you'll, you'll see that the greatest opposition didn't come from without. The greatest opposition came from within. And it was a subtle opposition because it, wasn't, it was in the form of distraction. It was in the form of losing priority. It was in the form of going for the good as opposed to the right. Uh, the good as opposed to the best. For me, when I look at this opposition that seems to rear its head uh, almost immediately as, as they begin to follow God, as they begin to you know, slipstream what the Spirit of God is doing in their day, just as they do that, opposition um, creeps in. Well, it doesn't creep in, it actually just rears its head. And I think back then to the Lord Jesus in Luke chapter 4. Jesus is baptized by John in the Jordan. And it says that he goes in, into the desert led by the Spirit. Okay, so he's been baptized with the Spirit. He's led by the Spirit. He's about to begin his ministry. He's about to quote from, from Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. He's about to move into that. And the devil arrives. And comes to oppose and comes to tempt and comes to try and pull him down and distract him and discourage him. So we should not be surprised at opposition. Anyway, that's in chapter 4. Then in chapter 5 and chapter 6, the rebuilding continues. And uh, remember the, the sequence of kings? Cyrus sent them back. Cambyses, his name doesn't pop up too much. And then Darius takes over. And it says that uh, in the second year of Darius, so we know that Darius reigned from 522, that's a historical fact. In the second year, it means that the rebuilding continued, or, or they revived the program of rebuilding in about 521, which, which leaves about, uh, you work out the maths, about 16 years of just living with an incomplete temple. Okay? Gung-ho, let's rebuild this thing, everybody's there. A little bit of opposition from within, a little bit of opposition from without, and it all gets put on hold for 16 years. And that's a whole thing for you to study. And then it says that, that with the, 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 the encouragement and the challenge through the prophets, which would have been Haggai and Zechariah, they are encouraged to, to carry on rebuilding. The leadership get together and say, come on guys, to quote God, let's lean forward into this thing. And they lean forward and they go for about six years. And it says that in, in 516, working through the dates of the kings, the temple was finished.
And so that's that's the first half of Ezra. The first six chapters deals with Zerubbabel and it deals with the rebuilding of the temple. And I, I, get your head around that story. It's a beautiful story um, and a beautiful piece of history. And it's so relevant and pertinent to where we are at, honestly, right now. And now we look at the second half of this book. And uh, chapter 7 to chapter 10. And this is the point at which Ezra appears in the book. In the first six chapters, Ezra hasn't appeared yet. He only appears in chapter uh, chapter 7. Um, and chapter 7 and 8 go together. Chapter 9 and chapter 10 go together. So let's look at chapter 7 to chapter 8. The king now of Persia is Artaxerxes. And we know that he came to power in 465. And it says that in the seventh year which makes it 458 BC. Remember, Old Testament time, time works towards zero. New Testament time works away from zero. Just get that, otherwise it can be a little bit confusing. So in the seventh year, which puts it at about 458, Ezra uh, returns. In fact, he's sent back. And as you read this 7 and 8, it's, it's, it's two beautiful chapters because yeah, it, it speaks about the person of Ezra. And there's this really important verse uh, talking about Ezra in, in verse 10 of chapter 7. It says this, that Ezra had devoted himself to study and observe the law and then teach the law. Note the sequence. First of all, he devotes himself to study. He devotes himself to observation. That means putting it into practice. And that allows him in God to teach it. That's the process. Devoted to study. I know what it says. Devoted to practice. I, I, I do this. I'm, I'm not teaching you theory. I'm teaching you what I've experienced. And then the third part of that is, is, the, is the, um, the teaching others of it. And so Artaxerxes basically sends back this man, Ezra, who is a, who is a very integrous man. He's a man of the word. He's a, he's a man of integrity. And Artaxerxes sends him back to, to teach the people living in Jerusalem God's word and God's ways and God's worship. Uh, and as you read that chapter, you, you'll see, basically, he was, he was wanting, Artaxerxes want, was wanting a happy people with a happy God because they were serving that God correctly. And so he sends Ezra back with, to, to restore word, to restore worship, to restore the ways of God. And it's a beautiful, beautiful picture. And in these two chapters, uh, Ezra, who for me is, is not your typical alpha male kind of leader. I think Ezra is one of those guys who leads more from his heart. He leads more from his knees than he does lead from, uh, you know, behind the scepter. We can call it that. And in these two, two chapters, he has, to, he has to gather a team. He has to gather Levites. Uh, he has to prepare a, 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 a team of guys to go back and bring the word. And that's what happens in these two, two beautiful chapters of Ezra chapter 7 and 8. And as you read those chapters, you'll see a, a little phrase that occurs over and over again is this, is this phrase, the hand of God. In fact, it says, the gracious hand of God was on me. And I love the fact that Ezra only ascribes his ministry and his success and, and the potential of success to this one factor. The hand of God is on me. It's a very, it's a very humble um, and yet very confident uh, place to be. It's a very confident way to view yourself. I can do this because the hand of God is on me. So that's chapter 7 and chapter 8. He gathers and he returns. It's a five-month trundle back from, uh, from where he is to, to uh, Jerusalem. And then in chapter 9 and chapter 10 uh, is, is a, an issue is faced in, in these two chapters. And it's the issue of intermarriage. And what's really interesting about these two chapters is you see the difference between the way Ezra the leader and Nehemiah the leader deal with the same challenge the same the same problem the same sin because because this these two chapters um the, the the story of that is repeated again in nehemiah but from nehemiah's point of view and from nehemiah's leadership skill point of view 
And I love the way both Ezra and Nehemiah deal with the same issue. Nehemiah deals with it like an alpha male, and, and Ezra ne deals with it from his knees. This, this problem of intermarriage, because when they get back there, they realize that, that so many of the Jews who were told by God not to marry outside of their faith, outside of their religion, have now married people of all sorts of faiths and religions. And, and um, it's put like this in chapter 9, verse 2. The, the problem, it says, that they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and for their sons, and they have mingled the holy race. Isn't that a beautiful little phrase? They have mingled the holy race. And now, now take that out of the context just of, of then, and think about what that means for you. Are we sometimes in danger of mingling the holy race? And I don't mean that from a racial point of view or a, from, a, from a demographic point of view, but this, do we mingle the holy in my own life? Am I, am I, have I got one foot in each camp? I think that's what it's saying. Am I, have I got a foot in the world and a, and a foot in the kingdom of God? Anyway, you go and read uh, Ezra's approach to this challenge of, of um, intermarriage and this problem needing to be sorted out. Ezra's approach is, is just so from his heart. He wears his heart on his sleeve. He, he's broken in his soul. And, and the people uh, catch the momentum of his repentance. The people slipstream uh, the brokenness of his soul. And, and, and he brings, around, uh, uh, brings about a change because of his own brokenness that the people follow. And uh, that's how the book ends. Because it just slides straight over into Nehemiah's return. And Nehemiah and Ezra, their ministry, their leadership, their role in the return overlaps. And we're going to be looking at the book of Nehemiah next week. So I hope that uh, these points make sense to you. I hope that uh, just breaking down the book of Ezra, uh, a book of, of, of two parts, uh, of the first return, uh, under Zerubbabel, of the second return, under Ezra, and, and a glimpse into this person of Ezra, his devotional life, his faith, his study of scripture, his, his leadership of people, of just a beautiful little cameo study of a particular kind of leader. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, and we're going to continue with our chat in just a moment. Thank you so much.